Today, Adnan with us on the podcast. Please subscribe to the Rosilla Show podcast and review it. Is Durant the best Durant we've ever seen? Kyrie says games one and two weren't as bad as we think. And the creators of the show, Billions. The Ryan Rosillo Show podcast. It was said before the show started, we're going to try to set a record for fun today. Is that is that possible? The challenge is going to become like, you're going to have to look back and say, okay, what was the most fun show? Yeah. Is it just in this brief infancy of the Rosillo show? Is it uh, including Danny Van Pelt, previous incarnations, other one to four show? Like what, what barometer of fun are you seeking to attain today? I just want to have a good time. We got Adnan Verk here, so we know that's going to be good. Mm-hmm. We have a creative side that we're going to do because Adnan was here. And I specifically tried to tailor this for you. So uh, Sunday when I was at the Greenwich Film Festival, I mentioned yeah. that probably too many times yesterday. Probably the last time I do it today. Maybe one more time. No, but, I still want to hear about it. So right. it's new well, to me. So David Levine, who's the co-creator of Billions, yeah. executive producer, he did Rounders, Ocean's 13, so he and Brian Koppelman, his partner, these are the guys that created this thing together. It's an incredible partnership. They're going to join us in about 30 minutes. We're going to talk all billions, <laughs> and you're going to lose your mind. Like, yeah. I'm afraid I might not even get to talk. Well, I'm excited because, listen, I think Billions is a great show. I was in right from the beginning. I, I love Giamatti. I and checked I think out for a bit. Yeah, you because when I mean, you're like, are you cut off? I'm like, yeah, like I, I watched it in real time, like when the finale happened. You were like several weeks behind, but to your credit, you caught up. And you, yeah, but now you're all in, and I can't wait to ask those guys a lot of questions. I mean, there's... Hopefully, listen, the show's a big hit, so we're not going to lead you down a path that you're not already aware. But if you know the show, you're going to love the interview even more. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. And I want you to put on the Federer hat at some point today. Um, I can do that, but I just I don't wear it like spring break, leg 80 style. So when I pull it down, it just, it's a tough look, and then the TV people get mad and like we actually can't even see your face. Before we get to all the sports stuff, I just heard the end of Levitard show with Stu Gotts, and Stu is ripping me again here. So what is he? He's worried about the celebrity softball game that Adnan is a vet, longtime vet of. Some would say the goat, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, some would. <laughs> different era. Different era. John Anderson formerly called the celebrity softball. He's much better than me. I'm way too over the top. But yes, I'm... I went I'm, to see it last year in San Diego, and over the top is putting it mildly. You are Stallone. <laughs> okay. Good movie reference. I'm, yeah. Listen, I'm affiliated with it, and I have a lot of passion for so, it. So you're going to be... It's in Miami. You're there. I'm there. I would love to finish out the career celebrity... You know, I want to go the three Letterman jacket deal. Football basketball and now softball i'd love to be a part of it but Stu's annoyed that i'm gonna get it or that see rosenberg goes back channels rosenberg got into the nba celebrity game and it was new orleans which is a second home for me and he got in but he went through the nba first class round trip tickets for he and his wife and the full gear and espn's like look we're we're done with you like you got your little shot in houston <laughs> enjoy it so i'd like to do the softball one i don't know that I'll be promoted to do it. Okay. Stu is down there. It's his backyard. He's afraid I'm going to get it, but Rosenberg will probably just find a way to do it all on his own. It'd be great if you could help me, though, Adam. Well, listen, what to say? Is there some sort of limit that it has to be only one of you involved? Like, why can't all it three It feels like one. Dude, it's not like the All-Star game. It's not like there's rosters. Like, we're only taking one guy from the Royals this year. And, like, you're Mike Moustakis. Like, mm, is it What's Alex? the obstruction rule? <laughs> That's Listen, the bottom line is this. If you want to play, I can make it happen. All right. All make right? it happen. I'll send an email right, right. now. Stu's out. Stu's no, out. I didn't say that. I love Stu. I'm going to be on the you show. You said tomorrow. it off the air. <laughs> you said Stu has no chance. <laughs> it is. It is tough that it's his home field, but I get it. But he can. Rosenberg's he can go definitely out. How is Pete going to get him? Pete Rosenberg doesn't even like baseball. He's yeah, on exactly. the K show all the time, just making fun of the Mets in case right. he's dangling all this stuff. Exactly. Okay, it's time for Straight Talk. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. Paul Pierce has just provided content for the world for the last 24 hours. And I want to re-air something he did. And look, I think Pierce is really good. I just disagree with him on some stuff. And I have this fundamental issue with anyone that was in the league in the 90s and the 2000s just dumping on everything we've seen. And I think he is sort of anti-LeBron, so he's pro-Durant. All right, there's my theory. I said it out loud. Oh, yeah. (laughs) He had said this about Durant. He may be the best player in the world today. Today? You are, wait. Today. Whoa. I mean, look, I mean, we're, we're on the final stage. LeBron is giving you good Paul, numbers. Stop. Wait, Paul, wait, stop. What wait, can't he Paul, do? I'm gonna let me Paul, stop you what, before you that start. Drink? What's in there? Cut what it out, can Paul. he do on the court? Truth juice. That was what was in the mug. That's what he said. Right, the truth. I'm gonna ask you this question, because I'm not gonna do this all day. Is Durant better than LeBron? 
Yeah. But why is it so accepted that this version of Durant is so much better than last year's Oklahoma City Durant? You know there's going to be recency bias. We both get that because mm-hmm. I was with my man Booger McFarlane yesterday on Mike and Mike, and Booger was saying the same thing Durant was saying. He goes, yeah, Durant's the best player in the world. You could make a case for that. I'm like, are you saying that or are you making a case for that? Because there are two separate issues. He's like, no, I think I- I'm saying that. I'm like, all right. So, and he, and he, we started going through these things. shooting. He goes, Durant's a better shooter than LeBron. I go, like right now, right today? He's like, well, what are we debating? We're not debating the best player of all time. Right now, who's the best player in the world? I'm like, all right. So Booger says, shooter, better LeBron. I go, okay, passer LeBron has him. No question. He goes, all right. He's rebounding even. I go, defense LeBron. He goes, mm, but Durant shut him down the last two games. I go, shut so, him down? What I are go, we talking about? Shut him down. Right. I go, so like LeBron LeBron's had, put up some sick numbers he's, here. Triple doubles he's averaged the first two <laughs> games. He goes, yeah, but when Durant has been guarding him, has he not They've neutralized good numbers. him? And good I said, numbers. I said right. no question. So he goes, the point is, Durant can D up when he wants to D up. It's all about effort. And giving the maximum, and LeBron does that more often, but Durant is capable of that. So I'm like, so because Durant is capable of playing lockdown defense, all of a sudden he's better than LeBron. Listen, I love Kevin Durant. He's been awesome to watch. He's a top five player in the world. Um, but it is interesting how this has gained a lot of currency after Pierce's comments. So here's what I would say, and as I kind of say, like, what do you mean, shut him down? When it's two games of basketball and you have these isolated possessions and you go, well, let's look at what's happened against Durant, and the numbers are very favorable for Durant's defense, but when it's a shot here or a shot there, I, I don't all of a sudden now say, okay, that means Durant is definitively better than LeBron, and that's why we're doing this. We're only doing it because we're up, they're up 2-0, and that's just the way the world works. So the recency bias, all of that stuff, you're absolutely correct. Adnan Burke, Rosilla Show, it's ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance, all of our guests on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. I'm just not ready to concede all of that. I think the Durant we've had the last few years has been really, really good. Defensively, I don't think he was as engaged. I think defensively he felt like he owed it more to this Golden State team because they were a better defensive team. Everybody else was playing defense. So if you want to say the defense is so much better that makes him a better player, hmm, all right, I'll give you the defensive part. But let's not forget the number one rule of this whole Golden State thing is that their offense, their world that they live in now for multiple years, this offense in everyone's range and the depth from where they can shoot it from and how they can all get into their shots – the versatility of a guy like Draymond, the death lineup pre-Durant, all of this stuff collectively makes it easier for everyone else. Durant's job has never been easier. I, that's not debatable. It has never been easier. So when we start doing, well, if you put Durant on the Cavs and this and it, the Cavs would have major problems. The Cavs would be down 2-0, or excuse me, 0-2. Mm-hmm. LeBron would be on Golden State getting easier looks, not having to go one on four every single time. It is okay to love who Durant is as a player, but it's also okay to say that this is a lot easier for him with a guy like Steph and a guy like Clay running around in this offense, and that somebody who's as dominant an offensive player like him actually seamlessly fit in. And I know there were some bumps along the way, but mm. let's let's not kid ourselves. The overall product is really good. I resist that this is a version we've never seen before, and he's. I just think it's a lot easier. Yeah, like I think if I looked at the numbers and said, maybe he's more of an efficient shooter now, or maybe he's able to show off that skill set a little more, but you're right. If I'm surrounded by star players, there's going to be less congestion in the lane, i.e. I'm going to be able to drive the lane better. My shooting percentage will be increased because there's more options on the floor. Like If you have better talent around you, obviously you're going to look better, and that's probably what it feels like more with Durant. But he does feel like the best version of himself right now. That's that's okay. I, you right. know, I'm not I'm not pushing back on that. But I, I honestly I don't think he's that much. I just think that may be true. There may be a relatively small disparity. It's not like he was great and now he's gone to a separate tier. But I do feel like this is the best I've ever seen Durant play. Yeah, but I think that's really because they're up two in the finals. Right. Yeah, and he's got all this talent around him, which is making things a lot easier for him. Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE network. So this is what we're going to do. Recap Game 4. How about Smashville? Couples making out live shots? How would you handle (laughs) people making out, say, in Quebec City in your early days? Uh, See, I would probably have gotten rattled back then because there's a lot of CRTC, which is the Canadian Radio and Television Communications legislation. So I'm like, are we allowed to do that? Is there a tongue? Like, uh, PDA. You apologize a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry about this. Sorry about this. Can we shoot a little tighter right now? But Freeze Pops is all over it. Everybody makes contributions over email to today's show. Yes. That was the thing Freeze Pops was hottest on. He sent us the Rex Ryan, Rob Ryan Bachelorette photo (laughs) with a hand creep. And then he said also this couple made out on a live shot in Smashville. And he goes, my work here is done. Yep. 
Now it's up to you, the talent. I thought I did a good job on the email. I thought That's your it. email was really good today, both of them. You did give two suggestions. Rudy was big on the thirst meter. J.J. Watt. Maybe we'll get to that later. Look, whatever J.J. Watt's <laughs> defensive awareness rating is, his humbleness rating in Madden is going to be 150 out of 100. J.J. Watt upset that he was named, what, 35th best player in the top 100 on NFL Network? That's correct. He quoted it. I played three games last year. Like, come on. Figure it out. We'll do it tomorrow, humbled or blessed. We were thinking about doing blessed, humble pie ratios. Like Russell Wilson, go. more. What percentage is he humbled? What percentage is he blessed? I'd say 80-20 blessed, humble. But that doesn't seem humble enough. <laughs> All right, the creators of billions. <laughs> Make one. it so it doesn't add up to 100. 90 humble, 20% blessed. Whoa. See, then it's, it's all skewed up, but it makes sense in its own way. Sorry, go ahead. I love that you said you would have apologized in a live shot if a couple made out behind you back in the day. But now I could see you just going to be like, yeah, let's get in there. Yeah. <laughs> America's changed me. The Ryan Rossillo Show. Rossillo. we got a bunch of different things we want to do, but this is going to be a lot of fun because joining us now, they are the co-creators, executive producers of one of the best shows on television, on Showtime. It is Billions, and it's David Levine and Brian Koppelman. So we'll go back and forth here. Billions, we know it's based basically on law enforcement against a hedge fund which actually is something that was happening. And there's real-life source material. Both of you have been around this lifestyle for a good chunk of your lives. How did you know this would be a story that hadn't really been told before would be something the audience would really like? Yeah, we've been interested in this for, I don't know, a good eight or nine years. I live in Greenwich where there's a lot of hedge funds. Brian lives in Manhattan where there's a ton more and the rest of Wall Street. So we've been around these guys a lot, and we saw – the way that these young billionaires carried themselves, the way that they sort of swaggered around like nation states with their own air forces and flotillas and armed security and everything. And we thought that it was an awesome story to tell. You know, we were fascinated. We love the movie Wall Street. We loved um, the movie Boiler Room. But we felt like yeah. this was the next iteration of the story that hadn't been told. So we've been working on the long time. The one part of it that you, you said, though, that, that – You said, how do we know audience would like it? I mean, that's one of the things about doing what we do. You don't know, so you have to like it. You have to be obsessed enough with the thing that, in a sense, if they don't like it, you've given everything you had to it and you told the story the best way you know how. So I would say we hope that the audience would dig it. We knew we were making something that we would dig, and then we got really lucky that it hit people the way that it has. Guys, what I think is such a challenge with this kind of show is that there's lots of different machinations. There's wonderful supporting characters. There's lots of detours. But ultimately, this is a cat and mouse story. And you're trying to have this uh, prosecutor trying to nail down this hedge fund guy. And unless you've got a real trick up your sleeve and and Damian Lewis is is behind bars in episode three and just goes away, uh, I'm imagining this is just going to continue, you know, for however many seasons that you can, can keep this going. How much of a challenge is that to do that and make that fresh and appealing even though the audience knows that this is going to take a little while? Well, first of all, we do have a lot of tricks up our sleeves. And things aren't going to be completely predictable. But it starts with these characters, you know, the idea of this hedge fund guy and this U.S. attorney who has a a huge set of powers in some ways similar and in some ways very different from the the wealthy antagonist. Um, You know, these characters have a lot of self-determination, they have a lot of latitude, and the moves they can make provides sort of endless storytelling opportunities for us. Yeah, and I would say after the first season, people asked that question, um, and uh, were like, how do you keep this going for a second season? And and by all accounts, the second season's stronger than the first. Again, like Levine said, we're just so fascinated and compelled by these characters in this world, and um, we're not worried about running out of story. I mean... You know, this thing isn't a runway, it's a highway. We're talking right now, the creators of Billions, David Levine and Brian Koppelman. Paul Giamatti is one of our great American actors. He can do comedy, he can do drama, and he exhibits that in the show. I love the scene where he's in therapy, uh, and his wife is mocking the fact that he always wears his three-piece suit and thinks that he's arrogant, and he says, no, don't don't you get that, that it's because everybody knows that, you know, you're so much better than me. Like, you're, you're, I just want to make people realize that, hey, maybe he's got something going for him. The way he played that scene the pathos of Giamatti, and you have sympathy for him, and the way that Wendy then has sympathy for him, and, spoiler alert, the second last episode where you think he's sobbing, and then you guys brilliantly reveal what it's all about. 
I mean, I just I think Giamatti is always must see TV. How keen was he to do this role, particularly the S and M stuff? Like first scene right out of the gate, <laughs> hogtied being urinated on. Was Paul all in or what? Paul was totally all in. Paul's a great guy, a great collaborator. You know, we agree. Uh, he is super talented. We've been friends with him for a while. We produced this movie, The Illusionist, that he starred in. And when we came to him with this opportunity, he jumped right in. Um, he was totally game for, for the S&M stuff. Sometimes you have to be like, Paul, put your clothes back on. There's no <laughs> S&M scene in this episode. Please, for the sake of the crew, you know, let's save that for when we have an actual scene. Um, but, yeah, you know, when he plays the scene like the one at the therapist office that you're talking about, he just breaks your heart and you don't see it coming, but it's so raw and real. And it was by watching him play scenes like that over the course of the seasons that made us realize that we had the actor that could pull off something as challenging as that, that scene in episode 11 of this, of season two. The thing about that episode that Adnan is talking about golden frog time, where as the viewer, you're going, okay, so here's what's at stake. It looks like Axe has him, and I don't want to give too much away for maybe the people who haven't caught up, but it's this total turn. It's incredibly well done with the idea that you think he's crying and he's laughing because of victory, but that you would put this character in this position that he would cost his father his entire life savings. Like Sometimes I struggle with, wait a minute, how could anyone ever do that? How great is it to maybe just smash through what you think reality would be to tell the story of who this character is. Like you may sit in a room and go, I mean, wait a minute, would anybody really ever do that? But it doesn't matter. Like it's almost like it's better to break the rules. I mean, the truth of the matter is like people destroy their lives all the time in moments of passion and out of hatred and anger. And so the scale might be different than the scale that you're used to looking at in a way but the, the sort of primal nature of winning at all costs, I think, is something that we've all looked at. I mean, think about a college coach who has a, a huge program and punches a player in the face, costing himself $40 million over the next eight years. Um, there's a million examples, I think, we can look at of people in positions of power who – Look at Anthony Weiner, right? If I, we would have written that, you'd be like, who would ever throw away everything <laughs> that he had and leading to basically the loss of a presidential? Like, who would ever do that stuff? So we think when you look at people in positions of that kind of power, the very stuff that gets them there very often is the thing that causes their downfall. And that's part of what we're really fascinated by. Talking with Brian Koppelman, David Levine, creators of Billions. Curious guys, Ryan and I were discussing like how shows conceptualize and come together, and the relationship episode, which ended with the uh, montage of With or Without You, and uh, Axe, you know, him and his wife had that huge fight, and all of a sudden she comes back home, and then he surreptitiously deletes all his voicemails. Does that scene, like, the, how, what, is, what is the uh, root of that scene? Does that come from, hey, how can we wrap this up with an iconic song that has all these images with us? I love the question. When we got the idea for how that episode was going to work, which was leaving the phone calls in that very conversation. We figured it out. We were like, and we'll call the episode with or without you. We'll use this song with or without you. And he'll delete voicemails while that's playing. It all came in one moment. Then figuring out how to do it was really hard, but the idea yeah, we surfaced in one in like, uh, uh, we couldn't figure out how to do that episode. And then suddenly that whole idea showed up at once. We loved the idea of a series of voicemails that showed various sides of his personality and his relationship, and that ultimately dug a huge hole for him. And then we realized that the ultimate Bobby Axelrod move would be to figure out how to just delete them. And then we were like, there will be, I mean, I remember, yeah, then we were all like, well, he'll mention this moment in listening to this song, and we'll play that song at the end while he deletes the messages, and it'll kill you. And then we, you know, all I can remember the first time we heard with or without you, like I'm 51 years old, Levine's 49. And so that song came out when I was in college and it would have come out for Bobby Axelrod when he was in high school. And it would have meant something in a certain way, the Joshua tree album. And so that, that whole thing kind of surfaced for us in one moment.
Talking to the creators of Billions on Showtime, David Levine and Brian Koppelman. Adnan's looking at me right now saying, say it, ask him, ask him, ask him. Don't be, don't be. I think the Wags character is really interesting because there's a really good chance that that could have been you know, Hobart, lax guy, like right out of central casting, right hand vicious. But you've made Wags this kind of spiritually messed up, just a different guy with the wax mustache. Like how... How far out of your way did you go to make him not out of like central casting hedge fund guy that may just be as mainstream as anyone would expect? Like, I think you guys did a very specific thing with his character. Well, in this case, it it really started with the actor, Dave Costable, who Brian went to college with. So he's known him forever. We directed him in our movie Solitary Man a while back. We've seen him do incredible stuff. So... Everybody basically came in to, you know, people auditioned for all the roles. We knew that we wanted him for that role from the beginning. And it was just a question of figuring out how to build it to showcase how versatile and amazing this actor is, really. Yeah, there's nothing that Costi can't do, and that's been the case since we were kids. And um, there was just no doubt. He's the kind of actor you can write those outrageous lines for. And like you say, he's going to just deliver them with this twinkle in his eye. And I'll tell you where the mustache came from. When Costi was going to do this and we knew the character would be outrageous, we said, hey, dude, you should shave your head to play the part. And he, acting as though it was an artistic choice, but truly out of the panic of how to shave his hair, (laughs) said, I think I have a better idea. Give me three weeks. And if you still want me to shave my head, I will. But let me show you something. And then he came in with that mustache. That sounds like a man who is is losing a battle with time. But I, I yeah, love. I, right. <laughs> <laughs> I know it too well. Hey, you guys are the best. Seriously, um, it's it's cool that we even had the chance to spend this time with you, and uh, hopefully, maybe we'll visit with you again before season three. All right. Definitely. Thank you, guys. This is fun. Whenever I hear this, I just think about Adnan's coding phase. <laughs> And how proud we are <laughs> of you for right, just, being able to overcome and battling with. It was a good demons. time. I'm sure it was. Well, but. listen, there was a lot of stories back in the day. There's no doubt about that. Adnan Verk with us, Rasilla Show, ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance. Pick from a range of coverage options with the Name Your Price tool to find a price that works for you. Kyrie Irving just spoke to the media. Says the blowouts in Game One and Two were not as bad as everybody makes it out to be. All right. We'll uh, we'll hear from him a little bit later. We get more on KD as well. Rick Fox just tweeted out that no res- no disrespect to KD, but no way he would ever drop forty on me. I'd take him out. So wow! He tweeted at Rick Fox. Rick Fox, a tough guy, Canadian, good looking, great on Oz, and not a guy you want to mess with. Well, I'm I'm not like. Is this a knife fight? I'll, listen, a lot of these guys, you seem to have. Not a chip on your shoulder. I do. You, okay, no, yeah. No, I okay, don't okay. seem, I do. You don't like these 90s and 2000 no. guys saying, if I was playing, then I would do this and do that. No, right? it's, it's the only thing that's like, that hasn't evolved, apparently. <laughs> no one's throwing it harder, you know? I used to always laugh. I used like the, the 360 or the McTwist back in the day with skateboards. Now guys are doing like three full rotations. <laughs> guys are faster. Like the, the 100 meter world record isn't in 1982, right. Okay. The stuff that NFL players are doing, and then no, no, sorry, somehow I think the '90s and 2000s guys think that the 50 greatest players of all time that was announced in what late '90s, yeah, that somehow then after that you were ineligible. That's when they capped it. Yeah, <laughs> so that's it. We're done. Here's your jacket, and the rest of you're screwed. I didn't think thinking on it. I think a lot of it comes down to pure male machismo because they always mention. Back in the 90s, it was a lot tougher, right? It's always tougher, more physical. All oh, those Knicks Heat series, That's fine. Yeah, they grind right. it out. And all the officials now, they call so much more stuff. That's what it roots down to. It's got toughness. Rawr. Back in the day, we had to fight Part of that's true. Stuff. Part right. of that's true. But you know what they would do if you dropped Durant in a time machine in the 1990s and said, here you go. He'd still here are your kill shorts. It. He'd still kill it. They'd go, what is this? This guy's seven feet, and he he's dribbling around. All He's pulling up from 30 feet. Like, what is this? So, anyway, they would... The government would abduct him. And we'd go, we're taking Durant with us and study this body. NFL news. We were waiting on Kaepernick updates out of Seattle, and we know they're not going to sign him, and that they have signed Austin Davis instead. So it's Trevon Boykin behind Russell Wilson and now Austin Davis and Kaepernick. It didn't work out. 
Pete Carroll said, quote, Colin's been a fantastic football player, and he's going to continue to be. At this time, we didn't do anything with it, but we know where he is and who he is, and we had a chance to understand him much more so. He's smarter. Excuse me. He's a starter in this league, and we have a starter, but he's a starter in this league, and I can't imagine that someone won't give him a chance to play. So that always makes me wonder, like, did you talk to him about being a backup? Did he not want to be the backup? I've been hearing now more and more that he would take any job. I don't know what I believe. In the beginning, I believed it was about fit and opportunity, what he was looking for. I'm now as confused on this story as ever. Others are not confused, just saying flat out. His stance, politically, socially, is why he's unemployed by all of the teams. I think it's the truth for some of them, but I just I just don't know where this thing is going to go. So Brock Heward was on Mike and Mike this morning from ESPN 710. Obviously, the Seahawks, all their coverage said this is what the Seahawks' strategy was. They brought a guy that's been a journeyman career backup on his fifth team. I don't even know if Austin Davis is going to be here come training camp. I think this is a couple weeks, and and, uh, there's going to be no guaranteed money, and this is going to be how does he fit, how does he look. You know, we're an OTAs, give him the opportunity, and and they'll continue to uh, to compete at that backup spot. But, you know, Pete's words were telling to me Friday. Colin Kaepernick's a starter. I think he deems himself a starter. Feels like he can start in this league, and they have their franchise starting quarterback already. In a vacuum, if you just go, really? Ka- Kaepernick's stock has dropped that low. Austin Davis is now the preferred guy. It, it feels really easy, Ryan, to go, yeah, then it's just the distraction stuff. Because you go, yeah, Kaepernick's definitely a better quarterback than Austin Davis. And I get the fact that he's a quarterback who does not fit in a lot of systems because of the fact he scrambles so much, he's mobile, etc. But Seattle, to me, really did seem like a genuine fit. And maybe we overplay the fact that Pete Carroll's this rah-rah guy and players coach and players love playing for him because ask Richard Sherman about that. He still wants him to apologize about the play call from a couple of years ago. So maybe we do make too big a deal about that. But I honestly thought, yeah, Kaepernick will fit with Seattle because they'll give him that freedom. I think he'd be accepting a backup there because it's a great team and, and Russell Wilson and him without chemistry. Like I, I just was really surprised. When, when I hear Kaepernick doesn't have a job, I go, all right, but if I say he's willing to be a backup and Austin Davis really is the pick, I'm not surprised by Carroll's comment. I don't think he's going to come out and be uh, totally transparent about what the issue is. He's going to try to take the high road and be like, oh, he's too good to be a backup. But honestly, it's now officially become confounding to me. And I know what Adam Schefter has said. Cap is going to get a look once training camp comes. Somebody gets hurt. All of a sudden, they'll get signed. But I, I do find it a little strange, Ryan. We're now into June, and he still doesn't have a gig. So let's just look at Seattle with everything you just said. I don't think anybody's going to tell you that Austin Davis is better than Kaepernick. Okay? So if Seattle just talked to Kaepernick and it didn't work out and they went Austin Davis, is it crazy for me to think that Kaepernick and his reps go, this is kind of what we're looking for and we're still holding out hope for an opportunity, whether it's an injury in training camp or something weird that happens, and we know if we come to Seattle, it's not an opportunity. There's likely not going to be any kind of guaranteed money. Like I'm just trying to look at this from the other side, as I'm sure there's so many of us, well, not me, including this, but there's so many that are listening going, no, they just flat out looked at Cap, said he's a distraction, we don't want him, we'll take the lesser player in Austin Davis. Is that what really? Is that what Seattle did? Then why even bring Kaepernick in? And these are the questions I keep asking myself. I really think Kaepernick needs to at some point, or his representatives, meaning his agents, they need to do some kind of public thing here where they go, hey, we'll sign anywhere for any amount of money. We just want him on a team and for him to give a chance you know, to, to make the 53. I think if that would happen, he'd get signed then, right? You can't tell me that he's he's not a viable enough quarterback. We all saw the numbers, Ryan. The last nine games last year, he had a better QBR, touchdown interception. He doesn't have great receivers in San Francisco. O-line wasn't very good. Like, no, the talent around him was terrible, but right. I never know I what to believe. Excuses there's, for there's all sorts of stat guys that are telling you Kaepernick was incredible, and then you read through Mike Sando's piece, which is an entire timeline of Kaepernick's entire career, where it's all front office guys, other coaches, scouts, the whole gamut of all of these people inside of the NFL that work day-to-day in this league telling you how bad he is at the position. So I don't know who to believe. Do I believe all the stuff from Sandoz thing, or do I believe all the statistical breakdowns that say he was actually incredibly accurate, but all of his receivers let him down? I just have a hard time believing that the Seahawks would talk to Kaepernick, have him visit, and then go, you know what? Now we're going to sign Austin Davis because we just don't want Kaepernick the distraction. If it was about Kaepernick the distraction and political beliefs and all this stuff, why even bring him in? 
Is it possible, and I know it sounds like because I'm so invested in my initial position of having an open mind about what's going on with Kaepernick's future, but is it possible that Kaepernick, his reps, they talked to Carroll and said, well, these are kind of our expectations, this is kind of what we're looking for, and Carroll goes, that's not a fit for us, like it may not be a fit for a bunch of different teams, and then they go with Austin Davis because they go, this guy doesn't think he's ever going to start here, and we don't care what kind of money we pay him, he's just psyched to get sweatpants. And I wouldn't expect Carroll to be that transparent about it. So you're right, then it's on Kaepernick's camp. Rather than people trying to say, is it just a distraction? Is it just the political beliefs? What is this about? To go, hey, we're up for whatever. He can't go into week one without a job. It would be stunning, right? Genuinely stunning that he can't but get then, a backup. And I'm not signing off on this, but then I'll hear the other end of it, that it's, well, if Kaepernick wants to make the full transition to Martyr, does he go, hey, I'm, you know, right? Like, I was blackballed. Like, that doesn't seem like it's worth it. Yeah, no, definitely Sweet. not. No, yeah, like, no I want to play. Yeah, I don't like, care where it is, I'll play. Do yeah. some activist stuff and take pictures now. Like, right. that can't, like, could he be that no. calculated? No. But I, people believe that, and I'm not I'm not ready to go there. Come on. The Ryan Rosillo Show. Rosillo. Jalen Rose in the third hour. Adnan Verk with us now, the Rosillo Show. It's ESPN Radio. We're going to talk a little bit about Durant, that this version is just... We're supposed to concede that it's this much better. And also Kyrie Irving talking earlier today, top of the hour, answering this question. What positives do you take from the two losses? So we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up here. I not heard that. That's good. Good Appar- question. Apparently the Levitar- uh, Levitard show staff is jealous of us, which doesn't happen a ton. Why is that? So, no, we'll, we'll, we're okay. we're going to get there. We're going to get there. there. All right. So actually made me feel good. You want to just do it now? We have it? No? Hold off. Hold off. He's yeah, got it now. So he's ready to go. We're good to go. Did you hear Stu say this at the end of the show? I did not. You guys hit it in there? Guys, I got bad news. I'm not getting in. I'm guessing Marty Smith totally <laughs> took your spot. <laughs> yeah, or Rosillo. Rosillo gets in those things routinely, man. I mean, any excuse. Oh, Peter Rosenberg. I guarantee it's him. Peter Rosenberg. Who I love, by the way. He's fantastic. He is great. Mm. But I guarantee you he got the spot. Peter Rosenberg. Yeah, he got the spot. Can we find out who got the ESPN spots? Or, or like, we don't know yet? We don't know yet. Okay. If it's Rosenberg, I'm good. Rosillo, not so much. <laughs> Only because Rosillo, not that he's not deserving. He is. He's been in the NBA Celebrity All-Star Game. I haven't been in any of this stuff. Like, Rosillo's fi- fine with Ryan. I like Ryan. <laughs> um, I'm just more deserving. I, it's Miami. It's my hometown. Are you jealous of uh, Rosillo tomorrow? Well, he was co-hosting a show. Who? SVP and Chris Long. Oh, no way. Yeah. I got Israel Gutierrez. <laughs> what you <Thank> got <laughs> that's great man i love stu guts can we play that perhaps one more time and again the beginning of the whole thing is him being upset about being left out of the celebrity softball game which you don't know weekend. for certain i can't imagine he's not going to get in it if he wants to get in it i don't know if I, i've tried to get in it a couple different times like we try to like i tried to get in the DK. minnesota one and then last year san diego i thought you and danny were making a big push for it yeah i think danny would have been in with right. Manfred, he still may be in because that's kind of his back backyard. So who knew he could just show up? But can you play that again? Because there's a very, there's a very kind of off the main mic, and it might be Mike Ryan when somebody says something positive about Rosenberg. I think there's a meh. No, is it Mina Kime saying about no, Rosenberg? I, I don't think so. We gotta hear it. Again. I don't know if it was Mina or Mike Ryan. So let's listen to that again. Play back the entire message. Guys, I got bad news. I'm not getting in. I'm guessing Marty Smith totally <laughs> took your spot. Yeah, or Rosillo. Rosillo gets in those things routinely, man. I mean, any excuse. Oh, Peter Rosenberg. I guarantee it's him. Peter Rosenberg. Who I love, by the way. He's fantastic. He is great. Mm. But I guarantee you he's Yes, oh, yes, yes. yes. It, it was, was many times. Yep. Yeah, it was many times. Mm. Yep. Doesn't like Rosenberg. We love Rosenberg. Doesn't like Rosenberg. Who the hell? Do, how could you not like Rosenberg? He's oh, I lovable. could see not liking him. No, he's awesome. If you meet Pete for five minutes, he's the best. No, I like him. I know him, but Mina doesn't. That was very telling. <laughs> well, at least she didn't have any opposition to you. It wasn't like later was still like. Hmm. Maybe her distaste for me is so strong. She didn't want to. She's just like. Hmm. She recognized the error of her way. We should get the video of that to see if there's an eye roll. In Mm. I'm going to be on with Stugatz tomorrow. Find out. Okay. Uh, they have me on tomorrow at 11 with him and Izzy, so I'll I'll get to the bottom Yeah, of he's got Izzy Gutierrez tomorrow. Is he promoed right. yeah. in that piece I got to right text there. Mike Ryan earlier. Did you want to come on? I'm like, sure. <laughs> All right. What is going on 
as we're sitting here with Verk Rosillo Show, ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance, you did, I think, some of the best radio I've ever heard you do. I appreciate it. Outraged about how poorly your son's <laughs> little league team is playing, and the fact that it wasn't just that they're getting destroyed, that they didn't seem to care. Mm. We're not as engaged as I was, but to pick up the story where we left off, we were zero and seven, and then final game of the year, we're playing the Yankees, and I said, I don't care what age you are, six, seven, eight year old, you beat the Yankees. That's meaningful. They had no idea what I was talking about. But listen. Throw the records out. Exactly. And it was in thrilling fashion. Who are you guys again? We're the Indians. Oh, that's right. So it was. Kind of surprised. No, I don't. 10-8. The kids we, on the Redskins youth football team? 10-8. <laughs> we pulled off the victory. Okay. Mm-hmm. It was our first one of the year, 1-7. and seven, So I said, all right, let's just go into the playoffs on a winning streak. We're the nine teams for the 9-8 matchup. On Get Saturday. hot at the right time. No question. And well, listen, if we can just win back-to-back games. Who knows what can happen when we face the one seed, which right. is going to be the juggernaut Goal Cubs. Gets hot. But they got upset, so it was yours. So anyway, Saturday we played, and I listen, we had Welcome to the Jungle playing. Uh, no, I had, you didn't. No, I had, you I had didn't. clips of, no, I had, didn't. I had clips of Rudy <laughs> ready to go. Like I was like, I'm, I'm leaving every motivational trick out on this diamond today. We're going to win this game. Young Yusuf is going to be a triumphant winner in two straight games. What's he batting? Where is he batting? He was batting because the coach said, listen, he's one of our best hitters. We're stacking the lineup. So Yusuf Arisim was hitting third. He goes, no, let's have him hit. Yeah, he hit third. Sorry, he hit third. Moved him up. Yeah, so he yeah. hit third in the lineup. And listen, he was a gamer. Three for three, RBI, two runs scored. A, couple a real of three for three, or are you keeping stats again? No, no, I was keeping stats, but he was a legit three for three. Ryan Cooney, also three for three. Coach's son, Pat. Hey, shout out to Ryan. And David went three for three with an RBI. Unfortunately, right, we, didn't, we did not have enough Yusuf, David, and Ryans on the team because bases loaded in the first, back-to-back strikeouts, we had... No runs. And then Ryan Lee scored five in the bottom of the first. Ooh, you, you can see where this is going. That's a tone, yeah. We, we, we put up a run, but all of a sudden the Astros came back in another five. Astros are hot. It was 10-2 top of the third. I wanted to light myself on fire. <laughs> I said, this what do you is think not the kids a- would have learned from that? <laughs> I said, listen, this is not how this is supposed to go. This is not fair. I'm so invested in this. I'm more invested than anybody else. <laughs> Give us one playoff win. One. It's a 9-8 game. Instead, as a bench coach, my boy's team went one and eight. We're going to meet for Froyo next Tuesday. That's going to be our year end. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm out. I don't, I'm okay. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm, <laughs> I'm, it's too painful for me. It's too raw. You know what? It could be worse, though. How's that? You could be Peter Rosenberg. Peter Jeez. Rosenberg. I guarantee it's him. Peter Rosenberg. Who I love, by the way. He's fantastic. He is great. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till Pete calls in. It's <laughs> oh. my favorite thing all week. Oh. Uh, Poor Rosenberg. And now, insurance-minded speeches from Geico. Let's talk about power. To illustrate this, allow me to tell you a story about how I moved a tow truck 25 miles using only my index finger. I was stranded with a flat tire. I opened the Geico app. Then, with a few taps of my finger, I beckoned emergency roadside assistance and a tow truck to my car. I invite you all to unleash the full potential of your fingertips with the Geico app. Thank you. If you had to, Adnan, pick the Hall of Fame you're the closest to making. Canadian. Just in general? Canadian Hall of Fame. What, they got like $3 billion in that? Country of $35 million. No, but the Hall of Fame, like, were they going to vote no? Well, Canada Walk of Fame. It's kind of like the uh, you know, Hollywood stars. Me, Alex Trebek, Wayne Gretzky, Michael J. Fox, uh, Will Arnett. I think Will Arnett has a star yet. Alan Thick. You could do that. If you stay on this path right now, I'd be shocked if you weren't on that. I was back on in Toronto Radio last week, and Dan Shulman was the co-host filling with my buddy Sid Sixero, who's awesome, and Tim McAlph is off. And Shulman said, he goes, hey, guys, just so you know, I know you can't Tim was off again? Yeah, Tim was off. <laughs> no, Tim works hard, though. And he said, I know, uh, you know Canadians can't see Adnan, but nobody waves the flag more than him. And he's, he's doing a great job. And I thanked Dan. And I said, listen, this is a nice compliment for Americans. If you were in Canada, mm-hmm. Matt Devlin's American. He's the play-by-play voice of the Toronto Raptors. He doesn't, Big fan. Yeah, he's great. He doesn't constantly mention that he's American. I consistently mention that I'm Canadian. And Americans don't mind it. You guys just find it endearing or harmless or don't care. If, if American did that in Canada, Canadians would be so outraged. Like, All right, sorry, enough. Yeah, you're American. Shut up. Go back to America. You like America so much. Americans are awesome. I'm constantly mentioning I'm Canadian. Like, All right, great. Yeah, Canada. The next hit I do on TSN, I'm going to reference an American every single answer. No, they'll get furious. Canadians no, get so bent it. on a shape. They go, all right, all right, go back to America then. How do you like Trump as your president? You go, wait, wait. not no. everyone voted for him. It's hey, okay. sorry, Arcade Fire. <laughs> You'd get into it. You'd start criticizing Canadian TV and that stretch yeah. that you. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd say, look, not everything's that funny. 
<laughs> SCTV you like, though. Russillo Show reminding you, you can listen to all three hours of the show on your phone ESPN app. So Kyrie Irving, media availability with the Cavs, had this to say about what they've learned from the losses in the first two games. What positives do you take from the two losses? Oh, man. Uh, well, you definitely got to take the positives out of a, uh, you know, a few beatings that we took uh, in the Golden State. Um, but when you watch it, it, it just it doesn't necessarily seem as bad, um, you know, when you when you rewatch the games because you understand that the things that you can't control they they they're, they're, they're just kind of boneheaded plays that you're just like, oh man, I, we can be better, we can be better, and whether they're speeding us up or whether they're getting in our chest or, or challenging us, we we need to hit back, and it's as simple as that. They're an incredible team. Um, but we understand that also we have specific matchups that we can attack as well, and we need to do that. And uh, I know T. Lou will have a great game plan for us, and um, you know it's our job as players to go out there and, and do it at a very high level. Poker all over T. Lou, by the way. The, putting a lot of this on him with some of the sets he didn't like what they were drawing up. Makes no line. sense, by the way. I was on with you guys. He's right. like, what do you think? I, sometimes, yeah. all right, fine. You want to switch out some guys, sub differently? Right. What, what are we talking about? His point is that the Cavs are not getting enough good looks, and that's on the coach. You have to figure out a way to get your best guys. It's a really good defense, picks. and you're not as good. Yeah, well, this is my point: is that if the Warriors play their best and the Cavs play their best, then obviously Cleveland's not going to win. So you have to not only have your guys firing, and LeBron's been sensational. Love's pretty good. Kyrie's got to figure out his shooting, and one of these guys has to step up. Either Tristan on the boards, or Jr. Smith has to score a little bit, or Corver off the bench, whomever. And then you still have to hope that the Warriors have an off night. If Durant and Curry and Clay, and Clay was unreal last game, like his eight of twelve is tenacious defense. Like if those guys are on, things over. So you have to hope for a lot of things to go right for your team and the Warriors. At least one or two of those guys to have an off game. Kyrie again now trying to get up for Game Three here. You know when you're out there and they're going at a high tempo, you're definitely like okay. That week that we just had uh, did nothing for us. <laughs> that week did that did nothing for us. And uh, as much as you want to work on going through their plays and their splits and their actions, there's nothing that can imitate Kevin Durant popping behind a three-pointer and shooting a tough shot that you've contested or Steph coming off a pin down and guys setting good screens. So we used game one and two. We got our kicked, and now we're here at game three, and we have a challenge in front of us. We've been running a bunch of rips of highlights of, of Golden State. And from game two, the one that I've seen the most, kind of the package, was there's the Durant drive on LeBron where I thought it was very clear that Durant saw that LeBron was tired. And he went right at him. And Love even helped defend it at the rim. And then Durant hits this insane runner to the right. It's a great shot. Then there's another one where Durant comes off a screen, three-point line, left side, hits this kind of shot where he's fading to his side, and he turns because he already knows it's in bucket. And LeBron even contested a little bit. Then there's two plays by Curry where Kevin Love gets caught in a trap with Tristan, but Kevin Love doesn't think he has to come all the way out to get Curry from 28 feet, and Curry pulls up, hits it, and then Curry hits another one from about as far out in transition. We are really guilty of overlooking how absurdly talented these guys can be making these shots. So if you want to talk about adjustments, you want to talk about the defense or what you've learned or what the film has shown you, that's fine. Maybe the film makes you feel better because those are really tough shots. You go, most people in the world can't make these. But that's why Curry is so good. That is why Durant is so good. And that's why this team is so good. And that's why it's so hard and people are so mad about it because they're seeing not just this, but they're envisioning, is this really what we're going to see the next four or five years? Like, that's crazy. I think it's a little ridiculous to go that far. They're like, in 2022, we're going to be doing a show going, up oh, Warriors again. Right. I'm over this. That's likely not what's going to happen. But we can kind of forget sometimes, well, there's a reason why there's really only these guys in the world that can do this. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think it's presumptuous to all of a sudden go, the NBA's got a huge problem now. The Warriors are going to you know, win four of the next five championships. So, I'm going, well, hang on a second. Like, there, there is going to be fluctuations. There's going to be injuries, declines in performance. Who knows? But, but do you buy that theory that dynasties are always good for sports, that it's good to have a team like the Warriors because either you're going to love them or you're going to hate them? Because I used to think that, Ryan. I would think, yeah, it's good to have the Cowboys be great. It's good to have the Yankees be great because then everyone, you know, it's polarizing. But I don't think this is great. I don't think Golden State being being a juggernaut. Listen, if the Cavs you don't, you come don't out, think they, it's great because you're afraid of what it's about to become. That's not so much in the moment right now. You're projecting. Right. You're worrying about what hasn't happened yet because you think it's likely. 
Yeah, I mean, my thing is this. If Cleveland comes out and punches Golden State in the mouth a little bit, we have a compelling Game 3. Cleveland doesn't even have to win, all right? But if it's just a close game within uh-huh. five, then, then I, would, I would be pleased with that. My fear is Golden State is just a runaway freight train in Games 3 and 4, but I'm like, I don't get how... I, I understand, right? 16-0 history, but I'm like, as a fan, is it really that fascinating? Well, everybody's going to complain because most everybody's not rooting for it. Right. I just get worried when we start doing the, what does the NBA need to do? Is this bad for no, the listen, I think, the irony, think of the irony right now. We got the well, the ratings are up. I gave that number. No, I, and that's not even what I'm doing here. But yeah. we've got this matchup three years in a row, and right. people have just universal angst about it for the most part. You know, whatever the pie chart would be, you like it, don't like it. It's over ninety percent don't like it. Yeah. And we're we're doing this right now as we're about to release a thirty for thirty on the Lakers and Celtics, and just celebrating what that was. Like is that is that because it's the is it or is that who we are now? Like in my pointing out that we are in this quest for constant change and we're always so like oh you know twelve inning baseball game my god right. you know, if we're going thirteen just call it a tie <laughs> like I can't believe people are arguing that they want ties <laughs> that's weird to me yeah. and so this is part of what we do as sports fans in the media that okay well this this worries me like ugh, this is just uh, you know so bad for the NBA we can't, right. we, we can't do this. And we have a documentary coming out that does the complete opposite, and we only look back on Lakers Celtics with fondness. No, I hear you. Listen, if the Warriors win this thing, and if they go sixteen and zero, that's an incredible accomplishment. And years from now, we can all cherish that. But you're right; if it's three straight years of this, that would get a little ridiculous. The Ryan Rosillo Show. Adnan and Burke been great today. Again, reminder tomorrow. Rosillo Show history, Van Pelt's coming back, first time in really two years. It was two years ago when he moved on to TV, and Chris Long from the now Philadelphia Eagles uh, is going to be with us. So the three of us, all three hours, really excited about it. Rosillo Show on ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance. All of our guests on the Shell Pennzoil performance line, including Jalen Rose, one of our best NBA voices going, and also the star of Jalen vs. Everybody. That will air tonight on ESPN, 7.30 Eastern. We definitely want to ask you questions about that, Jalen, at some point. And congrats on all that, man. You work hard, and and you definitely deserve it. So thanks for joining us today. I appreciate the love. Thanks for having me on. So I'm against the idea that this is like clearing away the best Durant we've ever seen. Like, it's incredible. It's awesome. But it's also a lot easier with the people that he has around. And I'm not knocking him. Are you surprised at how many are looking at Durant now, acting as if this is a version of him that we've never seen? I am. And post game, we were doing NBA countdown, and Paul Pierce said that he felt KD after game two was the best player in the world. And why? while I disagree with him, it made me realize that people haven't been paying attention to him. He's been in the top two or three the last five or six years. It wasn't like he said Clay Thompson was the best player in the game. So it became a subject for conversation on our network and in barbershops that really wasn't so far-fetched. So I agree with you that playing on the stage has elevated what people feel about Kevin Durant's game. Yes, he had joined a team that won 73 games last year in the championship the year before without him. But he's been a four-time scoring champ and uh, an unstoppable force, especially once he gets going. Is Paul anti-LeBron? Is that why he's doing it? Because some, some of us have speculated on that, because Paul has been on fire on the desk since he's been with you guys. <laughs> he's not anti-LeBron. It's just that this is his first year being in retirement, so he's probably chasing a hot take. What the really <laughs> All right, that's, I think, fair, and it's actually working for him, so he's no dummy. Yeah, people are raving. <laughs> people are raving right now about him, Jalen. For Cleveland, give us some salvation here, Jay. Tell us why Cleveland is going to win Game Three. They're a better team at home. Golden State due for letdown. Give us some hope for a competitive Game Three and a Cleveland win. Here's the salvation for the Cleveland Cavaliers: LeBron James and Kyrie Irving, along with Kevin Love. If you look at the stat sheet, their numbers have been terrific. But role players sometimes they don't have quality luggage, and their games don't travel. Now, you're playing at home, all of a sudden, Tristan's going to have Chloe and the Kardashians in, in the stands. He's going to be getting offensive rebounds. He's going to be scoring. He's going to be thumping his chest. He's going to have more energy. J.R. Smith, the exact same thing, making three-point shots, running back on his toes. Kyle Corver's going to be able to find his shot straight up and down like he was shooting it out of a phone booth. And all of a sudden, they're going to look like a different basketball team 
and I do feel like the Cleveland Cavaliers will find a way to win Game 3. All right, see, book it, Cleveland. We're just going to have a series, and then Game 4 will determine what's really going to happen. More with regards to those role players. Which one has been the most surprising to you, Jalen, that has been a no-show? J.R. Smith, Kyle Korver, Darren Williams, Tristan Thompson, take your pick. No doubt it's been Tristan Thompson because there was a reason why they tried to sign Andrew Bogut during the season. They knew that they needed another big body if they were ever to go against the Golden State Warriors. And so Tristan brings not only the height and the bulk along with the productivity that they can't replace. And so that's why he got an $80 million contract. And so it's going to be paramount for him to play remotely as well as he did again in the Eastern Conference Championship if they're going to prolong this series. Jalen, I think with the Durant point that you made, it's great because, well, at worst, Durant was, what, third in the league behind Curry maybe for a weird stretch or with his injury, and then you've got maybe – second to LeBron the entire time. But we did this thing, and I'm not saying like you or I specifically, but the way we talked about Kyrie after last year, that shot, it's incredible, like borderline top five guy, others arguing maybe you take him over Steph, and now as you've alluded to, like it just hasn't been the same. How much do you struggle with trying to stay consistent with who somebody really is in this league based on what they can do to help a team win? This is the best question ever to ask for a player that isn't caught in his feelings. Because this is how I separated the two. I was just like you, Ryan. I was enthusiastic about the way Kyrie played in last year's final. They came back from 3-1. He had an amazing shot on the right wing. He sealed the deal. He showed that he belonged on the big stage. But I was trying to tell everybody that there's another level to carrying your team like Steph Curry did and being not only the MVP of the league once, but the unanimous league MVP another time. Now, Kyrie is an all-star player on the verge of being an all-NBA player. Steph Curry is an MVP caliber player. And so that's how I was able to differentiate the two by not allowing the moments of Kyrie playing well. I had to remember the fact that while as a young player, he had his chance to, to run the team in Cleveland, and it didn't go so well to the point where they got multiple lottery picks that included Anthony Bennett, that included Andrew Wiggins, though he was a max caliber player, a team USA participant, and also a guy that when he, when LeBron James was out this year, they were winless, whether Kyrie and or Love were on the floor. And I love that answer because you know what? Nobody wants to hear from the guy after Kyrie hits this all time shot, and that is one of those things we're going to see on NBA film replays forever. Nobody wants to hear from guys like you and I saying, hey, that's an amazing shot. He was incredible the last three games, but. Let's not lose our minds here. It's almost like we're not allowed to do that, have that take after that kind of moment. And I don't know, maybe we're wrong for even trying to bring it up because people just call us haters or saying that we're just being anti. But like, I'm an apologist for the truth is what I like to say. How about Speaking of the truth, coming into this year's playoff, that's this year's finals, we had that conversation on our countdown show. Who would you rather have in this year's finals? Kyrie or Curry? Chauncey? Paul actually took Kyrie, and I took Curry for exactly what we're talking about. All right. Jalen versus everybody. This is huge, man. 7.30 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. You have climbed so many mountains, and now you're going to have your own show. Cameos from Kobe, Larry Bird, Michelle Beadle, Tracy McGrady, and so many others. Tell us about it. I'm really excited about it. I can't front. There was never a time before this project happened that I woke up and I've asked for many blessings. I've never asked to be an actor in any way, shape, or form. So when the executive producer, Nanashka Khan, and Melvin Marr, who are A-list, and director Chris Koch, they come to me with an idea about a comedic, a, a comedy of a single dad, it shows how he juggles his professional life, his personal life, his time with trying to be a dad, how he's torn between each of them, because clearly there's only one person in 24 hours in the day, and the competitive nature of what we do for a living as it relates to sports and entertainment and how the job market and how being on television while you're on today, you can easily be replaced by the next young and -and up-and-coming personality. So it's competitive. And so how I'm able to juggle countdown, Jalen versus Jacoby, appearing on To Tell the Truth and 
doing the multiple shows and car washes that our network asked us to do, but yet still trying to do my best to be a dad and be good at my job. So it's really a melting pot of all of those situations. And the people that are close to me, for example, Marla Gibbs plays my grandmother. Anna Marie Horsford plays my mom. Because while those are my two biggest supporters, they're also my two biggest critics. Good luck, man. And it's really cool because there's so many people walking around, have ideas, hope to have it executed, and you're going to see it tonight, man. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Enjoy it. Thanks for the love. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thanks, Jim. Again, that is tonight, 730 Eastern on ESPN, Jalen versus everybody. Thank you for listening to the Ryan Rossillo Show podcast. You can check out the show live weekdays at 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, and on ESPN News. The Ryan Rossillo Show podcast.